This is Debt Free in 30, where every week we take 30 minutes and get practical advice from industry experts about personal finance and living debt free. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. Back at the end of 2016, Robert Brown, author of Wealthing Like Rabbits, an original introduction to personal finance, decided that he wanted to learn a new skill. And the skill he decided to master was making butter tarts. Makes sense because butter tarts taste great and they're a Canadian invention with the first known published recipe appearing in 1900 in the Woman's Auxiliary of the Royal Victoria Hospital Cookbook. But the butter tart probably goes back to sometime between 1663 and 1673 when young women from France who settled in Quebec modified their traditional European recipes to make use of the ingredients available in Canada. At least that's what I read on the internet. But I digress. So when Robert Brown started making butter tarts, a bunch of people said they wanted to taste them, including me. So on May 1st, 2017, we convened at my office in Toronto and Robert Brown provided the butter tarts and we recorded the first ever Debt Free and 30 Butter Tarts podcast, which had nothing to do with butter tarts. That was an epic podcast where Robert Brown and I went on record as saying that the Toronto real estate market had peaked and so far we are correct. So good for us on that one. Now, flash forward to today. Today is Saturday, March 3rd, 2018, and we're recording this in my Oshawa office at about, I don't know, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Why? Because earlier today, we attended the first ever Butter Tarts Festival in Bowmanville. Yes, we're amped up on Butter Tarts, so what better time to talk about (laughs) money than when you have a sugar rush? So let's meet the round table. First, the Butter Tart Man himself, Robert Brown. Thanks for being the Butter Tart Man. How are you doing today? Doug, I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me back. And is that true what I said about 2016, you wanted to improve your life and learn to make butter tarts? Yeah, but the background of that story is around, sometime around New Year's Day last year, I was hanging out on Twitter uh, doing some banality and someone was talking about budgets and I tweeted out <laughs> in a sarcastic way that I eat enough, ate enough butter tarts that I needed a, a column just for butter tarts alone. And that person suggested that if I ate that many butter tarts, I should learn how to make my own. Ooh, ooh. Of course, I said, well, how hard could it be? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And it took me 15 batches of butter tarts before I got some that I considered edible. So I did. I kind of took it on as a personal challenge after that. And do you remember who was egging you on? on she on? was from Brighton, Ontario. She occasionally appears on television in a personal finance show, the one, the only Gail Bazox. Ah, she goaded you into it. Okay, well, that's that's very interesting. I had no idea that I was at the root of the butter tart creation. You were at the root. Wow. So goading him into it. So it be interesting to see what you goad him into uh, to next year. So mm. now guest number two was also on that first Epic Butter Tarts podcast, and she is the person who first uh, noticed that the Butter Tarts Festival is today. At least that's how I found out about it. I could be wrong. So this is all her doing. She is, of course, Carrie K. Taylor, author of 397 Ways to Save Money, Spend Smarter, and Live Well on Less, now available on Amazon, Kindle, or paperback, if you're wondering. She runs the Squawk Fox website, and she is a frequent guest on shows like On the Money on CBC News World and lots of other shows. Carrie, welcome back. I can't believe you're taking credit for <laughs> discovering the Bowmanville Butter Tart Festival. Oh, I just retweeted it. I just it. It was Gail. a retweet. <laughs> it was just a retweet. <laughs> so it, it appears he gave, that he attributed it to me. I, I said, I yeah, said always, her. always take credit if someone does. So it, apparently, all roads are leading back to guest number three, who of course is you know more famous than the three of us combined. She loves butter tarts, and of course, as Robert has just described, was the one who egged him on to perfect his technique. She was the host of a bunch of popular television shows, Till Debt Do Us Part, Princess, and Money Moron. She's also the author of, uh, I don't know. About a bazillion books. A bazillion, a bazillion, a bazillion books. Um, okay. You know, of course, my favorite's Debt Free Forever. You know, she, Money Rules was her last one. The most recent one was CEO of Everything, Flying Solo and Soaring, that she uh, co-wrote with Victoria Rice, who has been a guest twice on this show. I'm also a big fan of Victoria's. So, of course, Gail Vaz Oxlade, that's who I'm referring to. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm great. I am hyped up on sugar and ready to... Excellent. Well, and we've got the, uh, if this was a video, you could see the butter tarts uh, that we have in front of us that we've brought back from the Bowmanville Butter Tart Festival. Um, There's an array. An array. So there was... Some have bacon. Yeah, bacon. There's bacon in a butter tart. (laughs) And Gail liked the bacon. Robert, not so much. Not so much. A bit more of a... Didn't believe that was uh, an appropriate combination. I have no problem with uh, butter tarts for breakfast, but you got to keep the bacon Uh, and the butter tarts separate. But in your stomach, they're all together. So I think that that makes no sense. Oh, well, I can be adventurous, exactly. just not with my butter tarts. Exactly. Live a little. Adventure. Live a little. Raisins, people. Enough. Raisins. So, oh yeah, here we go. We're not we're not getting into the raisins or, or no raisins, because we all know what the answer is. It's no raisins. So, 
Now, you know, Carrie and Robert were guests on the show before. We recorded those shows in person. Gail was a guest way back on show number three, as a matter of fact. But we we recorded that show over Skype. And the amazing fact is that even though I was a guest expert on all three of those TV, TV shows, shows yes. and on the radio shows, I had before today never actually been in the same room as Gail. So it was it's true. Was, in fact, when we got to the Buddha Tart Festival, I hugged him and then I said, "Have we actually <laughs> ever met?" And nope. he said, "Nope." And nope. I hugged him again. Never met. Now, of course, when I think about it, I think I appeared on like the second last episode of the first show and the second last episode of the second show and the second last episode of the third show. And I was on your radio show like, I don't know, two weeks before there was no radio show anymore. So w- whatever you else can be the end of exactly, my career. Is that exactly. what you're taking credit This for? may be the last podcast you ever uh, you ever show up <laughs> on. So uh, but it's uh, you, you want to go back and listen to that podcast number three where Gail talks about reality TV and why she doesn't do it anymore. So you can you can listen to that. So so there you go with that back. Background as we continue to eat butter tarts, let's talk about debt. So we all know consumer debt is at record levels. The average Canadian household now owes about a dollar seventy-two for every dollar of disposable income they earn. And each person in this room, we've written about it, we've tweeted about it, and, and had many comments on it. And yet, of course, doesn't matter. Debt keeps going up and up. Yep. So my first question is: Does that even matter? So, because of course, statistics can be made to say whatever you want them to say. So let's just assume I own the typical Toronto house worth a million bucks, because that's what a typical house is, right? And let's say I have a $500,000 mortgage, because I've owned it for a few years. And let's say, uh, you know, I'm a lawyer or something, I make 250000 bucks a year. Okay, so then my ratio is two to one. My debt, 500, my income, 250. That's, that's two to, that's even higher than the average Canadian. Yeah. But that's not a big deal. I mean, I got a massive equity in my house because that debt to equity ratio or d- debt to income ratio includes all forms of debt, including mortgages. Well, it's more, I mean, that's not a big, big deal. So should we even be worried about of this? Of course we should be worried Why? about it. It's a disaster. I have beaten my head against this wall for such a long time now that my brains are actually rattling inside my skull, okay? Uh, it's a disaster because when you are in debt, and I speak mostly about consumer debt, I believe that there is bad mortgage debt. I mean, if you are overextended on a mortgage, then that's bad mortgage debt. But mostly I have focused on consumer debt, which is all bad debt. And when you are in debt, what you have done is eliminated your options. Because when the caca hits a fan, and in everybody's life rain falls, okay? When the caca hits a fan, if you only have debt and you have no savings, you don't have choices to make. You, you're just behind the eight ball, which is what we are seeing driving the payday loan people, okay? All the people that are barely hanging on by their nails are now heading to the payday loan stores because that's their only option. And they're using that money to make minimum payments and everything else just to keep their good credit. So Gail's voting no for debt. Um, Carrie, what do you think? Is, is I mean, in Gail's you know, doing a bit of a distinction. You're talking about consumer debt. Okay, that's what we're talking about. But again, if I loaded up on a mortgage five years ago, I'm sitting pretty now. Well, maybe not quite as pretty as I was at the beginning of the year. Yeah, a yeah. year ago. Um, so, you know, sh- she's saying we shouldn't. We should worry about debt because it eliminates your choices. Oh, I was here. I, I heard her. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I'm sitting right next to her. But you also it does, though, and I mean, the other thing is the mental stress. I mean, you're constantly having to catch up or wonder if you're going to make your payments or if you're going to keep your house or. Like what happens if you can't make your rent? You know, you need shelter, you need food, you need to eat, you need to take care of your kids, you need to pay for daycare. All these things weigh on you and and keep you awake at night. So if you don't have a slush fund, if you don't have the ability to make these payments, you're not living a healthy life. So yes, it reduces your options, but it also reduces um, your ability to stay healthy. So stress is a stress is a huge issue. And people tend to make debt decisions based on their 
now situation. And I'm not even convinced they're making good decisions on their now situations, but they don't consider what could happen in their future. Could they lose their job? Could interest rates go up? We went for five years and everybody said, oh, interest rates are going to stay record lows forever. Well, they've started to creep up finally, and I don't think they're done yet. What happens if they tighten up mortgage regulation rules? Well, they have. What happens if, what happens if, what happens if? And all of a sudden, a situation that was barely barely manageable by not by a reasonable standard but at least somewhat manageable becomes unmanageable because they had absolutely no room to move okay so those things all make sense and why then are we in the situation we're in because we cannot help ourselves we are dumber than a sack of hammers and we believe that as long as we can make the minimum payment on whatever it is we're using in terms of credit, that we're doing okay. All our family's doing it. All our friends are doing it. Everybody I know is in debt. So what's the big deal? And by the way, look how great the return is on the stock market. Shouldn't we just go into debt and use that in the stock market? I mean, when people say this stuff to me, I just want to throw up in my mouth. Okay? It's just, it's, I cannot understand how a reasonable human being can look at a negative cash flow situation and all the money that's going towards paying off debt for crap they bought that they never actually needed and think that that's a life. I mean, we have substituted stuff for real, real important, good living. Now it's just about going shopping. Well, and if I don't notice the negative cash flow, if I put it on my credit card, put it on my credit card, put it on my credit card. And so perhaps I don't see that that I'm digging myself deeper and deeper At and deeper. At some point, I know you're not a fan of budgets. This is one of the areas where you and I sort of part ways because mm-hmm. I'm a big believer in budgets. I've lived on a budget my whole life. When I was making crap loads of money, I still lived on a budget. Primarily because I knew I was going to make crap loads of money forever. And so I needed to sock away huge amounts of that money for when my game ended, okay, which I did, which is why I'm okay. But if you are living on a budget and you're paying attention to those credit card purchases, because you have to if you're on a budget, you have to file it somewhere, then you're more likely to be aware of where all the money is going. When you don't live on a budget, when it's just a matter of can I cover everything, that's when you fall into that trap. And we can we can talk about budgets, um, but over to Carrie and Robert. So why is it then we aren't listening? Well, I mean, if you look at this incredible field called behavioral finance, like they're really untapping a lot of interesting stuff as yes, to why are. all the logic and math seems to be lost because the emotions and the feelings get in the way. Yep. And we're really wired to make bad decisions. Humans have something called a present bias. So we look at our present self and we live in the present. We don't have really the ability to look into the future and see how those present decisions, such as spending money, eating poorly, not exercising, we don't see how those um, decisions today will play out in the future. Um, Sorry, and, and this while you're is, talking, I'm going to eat a butter tart. Please, that's, that's please a, do. That's a present well, thing, and there, that's right? The present thing, decision right? that yeah, you yeah. may we, regret in your We later know time. we should yeah. put the third or fourth butter tart down and go for a walk, but we don't want to because a butter tart is so tasty and going for a walk is work. And that's the same problem as putting money aside for retirement. We don't see ourselves Absolutely. in the retirement years. So it's this present bias that takes over and we make dumb decisions. So one of the things that I have tried to encourage people to do is to imagine themselves in the future. So I want you to, as a 26-year-old woman, I want you to think about what your life is going to be like when you're 60. So the income you have right now, you have to take only 70% of it and live on it. Can you do that? And when people do that, they, if they consciously buy into it, then they tend to change behavior a little bit. It's a great point. I do a lot of speaking at colleges and universities, and one of the points I make when I'm trying to convince people at the college university age to start saving as soon as life is possible is saying, I'm not asking you to save all your money. I'm saying save 15% of it, which means you get to live on the other 
eighty five percent. No, the yeah. government you know? takes a chunk too, there, Robert. Yeah, yeah I, but we're always about talking about tax. net dollars. Yeah. Net dollars are <laughs> yeah, for, for <laughs> sure. And and listen, every situation is different. But you, we're not asking you to sacrifice your life now by saving a little bit for your future. A decision that's going to pay off huge dividends 30 or 40 years but, down But the there's road. something else that kicks in when it comes to behavioral finance. It's the whole idea of um, FOMO, fear of missing out and loss aversion. I mean, you can tell people don't go into the stock market, you know, when it's at a high, you know, dollar cost average, or why are you selling when everything's crashing, right? We have this feeling that if we lose that little bit of money, even if it's 85%, we're going to miss out. So we have to deal with fear of missing out and loss aversion and the present bias and all these things come together. And with the way that our brains are built, you know, we've got this thing in our head called the amygdala, and it's been around since prehistoric times. It was really good at survival. It kept us alive. It kept us fed. It sur- we were able to run from the wild cats in the forest. But it's really bad at, you know, understanding how to invest in the stock market. <laughs> it, it, it trips us up a lot of the times. And I think if we sit down as financial educators, financial writers, and say, yeah, there's a logical end of this money situation. There's the math side. Mm-hmm. But there's also the emotion and how our brain is wired. Side. Absolutely. System one versus system, system two. two. And you've got to marry them together and show people like, you are going to want to sell all your money when the stock market crashes. Mm-hmm. But me, because I've, I'm knowledge of this, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's when the stock market's on sale. You know, that's I when I saw I you tweet buy. that when we were having that little dip just recently. Yeah. I saw you tweet that. Look, everything's on sale. Let's go shopping. Yeah, I know. Yeah. This is when you buy people. Yeah. You know, it's a small sale. Yeah, but our but brains don't work that way. Because exactly. Because we see today, we don't see yesterday, we don't see tomorrow. And you're right. If I was willing to buy that stock for 50 bucks and it's now trading for 40. Why wouldn't I buy it? Right. Buy more. Exactly. Yes. So the other thing is, is that we don't like saying no to ourselves. Okay, we don't like saying no to anybody else. We really don't like saying no to ourselves. In my house, when my children were little, when I said no, the response was no say no a me. Okay, and so we still use that term in our house, no say no a me, because as human beings, we're hugely resistant to the word no. And don't shop is a no. Don't use credit is a no. Um, don't go out on a vacation you haven't saved for yet is a no. So one of the things I tried to do when I wrote uh, Money Rules was to bring in some of that psychological stuff like embracing anticipation and the research that shows the time you take to save the money for the vacation is actually more beneficial to you. You enjoy it more than the actual vacation. You go on the vacation, you come home, it's gone. But all the time you spend anticipating the vacation is actually like you're on vacation. I actually touch on that in my book a little bit, that for some reason, people who typically aren't savers are able to save for vacations because that's part of the process for them. They find out how much something will cost when they get there and they make sure they set aside that money where they would never do the same thing for a car or a thing, but they'll save for their vacation. So good for them for that. And uh, hopefully they'll start saving for some other things too. too, I'm going to save up for vacation now. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going on vacation next week. We saved for it. There you go. And and (laughs) so what you're doing is kind of tricking your mind then. You, I mean, you use the phrase. I think um, you play into your mind. Yeah, I mean, you're if you're, you're, getting tw- if the you're 24 today, yeah. think of what it would be like when you're 60. Yes, if you put yourself in your 60 year old shoes, just look at your mother, look at your grandmother, see what their life is like, and how are you going to have as good or better a life than that if what you're doing is spending every red cent you make right now. And which is the same with a vacation. It's taking myself out of the present and looking forward to the vacation. And and you're right. The studies are pretty conclusive on that, that the anticipation is is even, you know, gets the neurons firing even more than the actual thing. So is... It's one of the reasons why debt repayment is so hard for people, okay? Because they pay a little bit towards their debt and it still feels like a humongous amount. One of the things I have suggested to people particularly for things like student loans, which tend to be quite large, is make a tree, glue it to your back of your door. Every leaf is $100. Every time you pay off $100, you pull it off the tree. Great because idea. denuding the tree visually, it's like the jars, okay? Visually, it's a reinforcement that you're making progress. Yeah, because it's kind of hard to see money in the bank account or on a statement, whereas you plaster it on a wall, it becomes very visual. Yes. So... Is the world different today than it was, I don't know, 
30 years ago? Yes. Totally. Completely uh, different. Completely. Social okay, media. What's different? Uh, so basically with all the knowledge that we've come across with behavioral science. My background's in computer science. And part of my job as a human computer interaction specialist was to get people to click buttons. So we learned all this science to learn how to get people to click the right button, to do the right task. We learned about defaults and and systems that get people to make the decisions we want to make, have them make. Sometimes for their betterments, they don't lose their computer files. But all this knowledge has played out in the banking system now. It's played out on social media. And all these systems are rigged to get our brains all fired up um, and addicted or excited or programmed to do something. Perhaps it's not the best financial decision for us. Mm -hmm. So we see... Um, the way ads are created. We see how they've placed things. We've seen how they've popped up a decision that's more profitable for, say, a, a financial institution. And we see how selling has changed as well. You know, I remember as a kid, I would go to a bank, I'd have my, my savings passbook, and the teller would be all excited that I just saved five bucks. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, I go in there, and it's not so much you know, how to service the customer's best needs. Can and, I sell you some overdraft protection? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm it's constantly being pitch. sold something. They have a whole sales platform with a whole list. Would you like a line of credit today? Would you like a mortgage? Would you like your credit card limit increased? And all these things, at first, it felt kind of good because it's like, oh, I've done something good. I should get a credit re um, increase, right? And so it's kind of played out that it's a positive thing. But they're selling me data is what they're doing. That's so what they're doing. We're seeing a lot of this. And out in social media, we're seeing the other system that drives me bonkers is we're seeing a lot of financial information um, and it's thinly veiled as beneficial financial information and what it really is is a pitch for a financial product. So at the end it'll be like sign up for this credit card. So, you know, why aren't we good at money? Well, you know, even the people who are trying to get the best information for their buck, they're being sold a line and they're being sold it through websites or bank referrals. I mean, it's so hard to get to the good stuff now. So 30 years ago, you couldn't just get a credit card. If you weren't credit worthy, you couldn't get a credit card. You had to have assets accumulated. You had to show you had a strong work history before anybody was going to give you a credit card. Okay. You had to show capacity, capacity to repay. My mom couldn't get a credit card. I couldn't get a credit card. Yeah. In my 20s, I couldn't get a credit card. I didn't qualify. And I did a lot of work for financial institutions back then. Now, back then, I wasn't working in personal finance. I was working as a curriculum designer for training materials. And so, for example, I worked with one financial institution when they were building their credit application processing system. They had their own credit scoring system that used the five Cs. Okay? And so I knew... Everything that they were looking for, I knew you couldn't get credit if you didn't have a telephone. If you didn't have a landline, back then there weren't any cells. If you didn't have a landline, you couldn't get credit because there was no way to collect. Mm -hmm. Simple things, okay? Little things. So this all changed when we decided to embrace wholeheartedly the credit score, which I consider to be the single worst thing that ever happened to us. I think the credit score is perhaps the most detrimental thing that has happened. And it's a perfect example of people making bags of money when the people they say they're serving are encouraged to do the wrong thing. Yeah, because a credit score is not for your benefit. It's for the benefit of the lender. So did you know that the credit score was originally created as a marketing tool? What happened was they created this credit score so they could measure how profitable people were. Well, the same criteria are still in place, which is why if you only make your minimum payment, you have a higher credit score. If you have lots and lots of different kinds of credit, you have a higher credit score. All the things that will give you the best possible credit score are actually terrible for you. If you cancel your credit card, you get a lower credit score. Absolutely. It's crazy. And now, and now we have credit score companies who will email you your credit score on a monthly basis if you want to without people understanding that if your credit score goes up, in some cases, not necessarily, it's because of bad behavior. And those same companies that are giving you a credit score and information about it are the ones sending you offers to lend you money Absolutely. or to lend you credit cards. So it's it, they're not making the right decisions based on the information they're receiving. So I got into a big fight with someone on social media about this, okay? Because she was plugging an organization that was offering a free credit score. And all you had to do was go and fill out their stuff and they would give you a loan and, and they turned me down. 
because I didn't have a credit score. They turned you down. Yes. There's an actual story you're telling us. Yes. Okay. They turned me down. And then I started being inundated with offers. So I'm not good enough to lend to, but you're going to sell my name to a whole bunch of other people. Okay. And so I got in touch with this person on social media and said, you you can't be doing this. You can't be repping this because these people are evil people. (laughs) They're bad people. And I always would, wonder what Gail thinks. <laughs> I, can, I can never read between the lines with what, what she's saying. But, uh, she's not very clear. No, I don't understand. But okay, you've you're, you got some kind of negative feelings towards these people. Is what you're saying. Gail, so, so many the shades people, of she subtle. She has all the feels. Uh, she I see, yeah, I can see. She would be yeah, that. there you go. <laughs> so the thing is, is that, you know, I lambasted her and, and she sort of defended herself by saying, well, I went to their offices and I saw what they have. Really? Because you're that naive? Did you ask her how much she got paid? Because well, this is the that, whole influencer the thing. thing. That's the thing. When we talk about influencers, there are a whole bunch of personal financial bloggers out there that are not talking about personal finance. They're selling somebody else's product. So how do I know then when I'm reading a blog, I'm you know looking at something on the internet, whether the person's reputable or not? It's hard. It's really, 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 really hard. Are you saying it's hard? Um, it's really hard. I go after some of them because they don't write the word sponsored <laughs> or spawn or ad after a tweet. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard when you see these people given credibility in, by the media organizations oh. that have them come on and interview them. Um, and they don't um, disclose the conflict of interest that they're, you know, I'm taking money from XYZ Bank. Oh, let me talk about their products. Or or maybe they don't talk about their products at all. Maybe they talk about a system like the credit score. So these people will go and talk about the credit score, tell you how to game the credit score, because don't you just want to level up to be in a higher level? Our brains want us to do that because we want to hit, you know, let's get the 800 because then you get a better rate. Yes. And so when, when I say to people all the time, I don't have the best credit score and they go, what? Yeah. You, Gail Boss Oxlade, you don't have the best credit score yet because I'm not an idiot. You're not gaming it, Gail. Come yeah. on, get with the program. S- so <laughs> so what am I supposed to do then? I okay, should... so this is, uh, I, 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 I think the media <laughs> organizations need to do a much better do- job of vetting um, these these people that come on and say like they're repping this, you know, they need to go through their social media feeds. Well, but you're, this so you're, hard. and I, I agree, but you're putting as the a, responsibility on the media organization. Well, if they're going to bring so in a person, what can I as a, do? As a person, you need to look at who's giving you the information and you need to see where you've received the information from. Are you getting the information on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook? Is this person got a, um, a history of repping different companies, this company, is there a post on their blog that says sponsored? A lot of these people are in the mindset that they're freelancing to a bank. They don't see that they're um, promoting product for a bank. But you've got to get that into your frame of reference, that influencing is selling, and they are selling to you. So I very often give recommendations on social media. I mean, I'm a Twitter girl. I love Twitter. And just the other day, um, there was something about you know, savings rates being so low and and I said, well, that's because people are just too freaking lazy to go online and shop around. And then I listed four companies that give better interest rates than bricks and mortars traditional banks. Oh, for savings or GSEs. I saw for that. For savings, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so the thing is, is that when I say that, nobody's paying me for that. I'm saying that because it's true. <laughs> okay. And so that's what people have to do. People have to decide. They can't just take what someone says, not even what I say. You can't just take what I say and walk away and say, okay, now I know, because you don't. You have to take what I say and then go do your own research. And if you're too lazy to do your own research, then you deserve to get scammed. It's not just what you say. It's what the banks say, too. You need to do your research when a bank says, hey, do you want this um, mortgage equity, life insurance? insurance? No, no, no. I want to talk about mortgage life insurance. Whenever somebody says to me, you know, well, the banks really give good customer service or banks stand up and say, you know, we're really interested in our customers. And I go, any bank that sells mortgage life insurance is stealing from its clients because it will not pay out until you make a claim. And that's when you find out you don't qualify. It's a just, it's an absolute shell game. I can't believe that product still exists. So, and, there, and there's a good example. So what you're saying is you got to think, 
you got to, you know, kind of crunch some numbers, do some analysis. So in the example you're giving, so I'm, you know, buying a house, I'm getting a mortgage and the bank person says, hey, would you like mortgage life insurance? So if you die, it pays out. So it seems to me the obvious thing I would do there then would be go and talk to my mortgage agent, or sorry, my life insurance agent. Assuming you have one. Assuming I have one. Because loads of people don't have life insurance agents. But I guess at, at the very least, I should be looking find around one. then, find one, and go, okay, so my mortgage is going to be $400,000. Okay. How much is 400000 But that's not what happens. See, what happens is I'm in the room, and you're giving me a mortgage, and I'm shaking. Because one, I can't believe you're giving me the mortgage, and two, this is more debt than I've ever had in my whole life. So and I'm three, shaking. It's a huge decision. You got so much going on in your so mind, much in so your much head. other and they things slip to do. Yes. They slip it so in. So when you say to me, "No, if you were to become ill or you were to die, would you want to be able to protect your partner?" Natural answer. Of course, I would. Sure, sure I would. Sign here. And it's that Done. simple. Done. So I, I don't have time to think. Okay, and. Part of that is because people don't spend enough time thinking. We're so busy. So this is just an observation of life, okay? We're so busy doing stuff, going to Butter Tart Festival. Mm, Butter Tarts, yes. That we don't actually spend the time we need to just thinking. You know, so this is something that I have said recently on Twitter. And so I think a fair amount of people know this now. I'm a depressive by nature. And one of the things about depressives is that we are prone to what we call rumination. Rumination. All that is, is thinking that won't stop. Okay. That's all rumination is. And so by my very nature, I am a thinker. And if I don't have enough space to think, like when I was making television, there was very little space to think because it was just go, 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 go. I don't make as good decisions because I haven't had a chance to weigh one against the other. And that's really what we need to be doing. We need to be spending more time on the decision so that we don't have to spend so much time fixing it. Yeah. And and you just hit the key point there as to what thinking is. And of course, you know, I'm an accountant. So to me, thinking is, well, do the mortgage amortization schedule to see what's going to cost you. Okay. No, that's math. That's not the same as thinking. Thinking is kind of what you described. In my brain, I have two different people, two different avatars, whatever you want to call it. And they're, they're arguing each side of the issue. So exactly should right. I get this or should I not get that? And that's very hard to do. I mean, you, Carrie, had talked about normalcy bias, recency bias, where, you know, I'm, I'm in the present. It's very hard to separate out and see two opposite things. There, there's the money sense, which is the math and logic. And then there's the common sense, which is the, is the intellectual, emotional ugh, feeling, right? Mm-hmm. Money sense is not common sense. And this Mm -hmm. was a mistake I grew up with because to me, I'm a math person. So of course, I'm going to run the amortization table. I'm going to look at compound interest. I'm going to be excited about that because Mm -hmm. that's more of the way my mind works. But yes, those two things, and especially when you're in a high pressure situation in a bank and they just slip it across the table, banks are great for that. Yes, they are. And it's, everyone's good at that now. I mean, when you're buying something online, you get a pop-up. Hey, do you want to add this? You'll get free shipping. You know, spend twenty dollars more. It's these little, you know, add-ins and slip-ins. It erodes your wealth so incredibly quickly. I mean, impulse spending is the misfortune of the saver because all these little mistakes you make—well, a big mistake with mortgage impulse insurance spending is the misfortune of the saver. Did you make that up? I think so. Okay, yeah. the uh, you did now because it's Probably. on record. Impulse spending is, is the misfortune, misfortune of, of the, the saver. saver. Hmm. That's where it goes. And you have to ask yourself, you know, what's driving your desire to go shopping all the time? I mean, are you lonely? Are you bored? What's, what the hell's going on? Get a friend. What are you, go what are you filling? What, what yes, need are what you is filling? the hole that you are filling? filling? And I say to people, one of, the things I f- one of the things I find frustrating about FOMO, fear of missing out, is that people with good self-esteem don't give two rats butts about what everybody else is doing. They're perfectly fine with them. So I see it as a huge reflection on our lack of self-esteem as a society. So, okay, let's get into the practical advice portion here since I see by the clock that our 30-minute show was over three minutes ago. We'll be debt-free in 45. That's right, yeah, it'll be debt-free in whatever we, we make it. So oh, baby. so what what is the answer? So I'll start with you, Robert, because um, obviously Gail and Carrie have already touched on a few things. How should I be approaching this? How should I be thinking about this? What should be going through my mind? 
I'm a big fan of delayed gratification. And if you're looking at making a big spending decision, very, very, very rarely do you need to make it quickly. Take the time to think it through. Take the time to see if there's other options. See if it's really that important to you. Don't make decisions on spending very quickly, especially on the big ones like cars and home renovations. You'd be amazed how many people spend tens of thousands of dollars on their home without thinking about it for any more than a week or two with the first contractor that comes in the door. I'm the guy that walks around my house with the tape measure trying to decide where things are going to go and buying the little mini cans of paint at home hardware to get the right color. Right? By the time I get around to renovating a room, I've thought about it for a year or so before I do it. I, I overdo it sometimes, but really take the time to make sure you're making the right decision not just financially, but making the right decision and doing the right thing, which means you won't be doing it over again, which is the right decision financially. Yeah, so so push yourself away from the table. I mean, I'm thinking about it. We probably spent more time analyzing which butter tarts to buy today than some people would spend on, you know, what car I'm going to buy, what uh, some of those, those big decisions. Okay. Because part of it is there are so many choices that we get overwhelmed and we just want to make a decision. And we, and as soon as we make the decision, we want it implemented. And we feel better having made the decision, I guess. Yes. There's and, that and, uncertainty. And often the people selling are better trained at selling <laughs> than we are at saying no. Well, it's absolutely. absolutely true. Gail mentioned the, the, the mortgage life insurance. That bank manager or that bank salesperson has been very carefully trained in how to present that in such a way that to buy it. And that poor 26-year-old who doesn't live in the personal finance world who's buying his or her first home and has all those pressures on them, what chance do they have? Yeah, they're, they're kind of toast. If, you, if someone slides something across the table in that way, sit back and ask questions about it. Ask if that can be added on later. Um, you, you know, we're so polite. We don't want to speak up and raise our hand when we don't understand something because we feel stupid. That's okay. It's okay to not understand everything. You know, sit back and say, no, I'm not interested in this now. I don't understand it. Can you explain it to me? Is it something I need now? We see this with telecom companies calling us up, selling us bundled packages. We see it with banking. We see it online. I'm a big fan of going on a social media um, hiatus, holiday, because a lot of the buying decisions we're seeing millennials make are made through social media. So they're on Instagram. They're seeing their friends have these fancy vacations. Do they post their credit card bills on Instagram as well? I've never seen that. Hey, listen, way back when I was the first guy who said, if we walked around with little LED displays on across our foreheads that showed how much we owed, our fancy cars and our granite countertops would not be as impressive. Mm-hmm. And I do it all the time. I'll be in a coffee shop and I'll see somebody drive in in a fancy car with fancy clothes. And I just always ask, I wonder if that person can truly afford it. Maybe they can. I don't know. Okay, Maybe so I'll they tell, can't. I'll tell you a quick story. <laughs> I take my daughter in to have her wisdom teeth out. And as I'm paying the dentist, who I already have a relationship with because he's already yanked my teeth out, um, I say to him, can I write your check? And he says, yes, I know you're good for it. He said, you would not believe the number of people that come in here. They live in Forest Hill. They drive um, foreign SUVs. They have a cottage and they travel three times a year and they bounce their payments to me. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, you can't tell by looking at the looking at the outside. So it's all a filter. Yeah, you know, social media is a filter. Instagram's a filter. Facebook well, is it's a fake. huge filter, and we we like to put the filter on our life and show people, you know, the positive. Meanwhile, you don't realize what's happening underneath. So I say, turn it off. Realize that everyone has a filter. Don't let the FOMO hit you up when you see fancy vacations, new clothing. All this fancy makeup I see people wearing, well, including you know, the guys. Look at that T-shirt you're wearing today. It's adorable. I think it's, I want one just like it. I think I might have yellow armpits <laughs> on it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's okay. Robert and I have the makeup going, so we're all we're all yeah. feeling good about it. So I shave today, just for you. Yeah, there you go. So Shaving so on a Saturday. That's pretty good. So okay. So Robert's advice, you know, take time. You know, step away from the table. Think about it. Carrie's saying, ask questions. You know, don't be sucked into the whole social media thing, ignoring the FOMO. Gail, what say you? Add it all up. If you don't believe that you're in a mess, it's because you probably haven't added it all up. People like to keep all their debt in little piles. 
So I have $2,500 on my credit card and I have a little bit of a student loan left over and I have some line of credit stuff. And oh, by the way, there's a buy overdraft. And yes, I did a home buyer's plan and I did a buy now pay later and they won't add it up. Add it up. And when you're done puking your brains out, then go and buy a copy of Debt Free Forever or borrow it from the library and figure out a plan. Make a plan. Excellent. Well, I think that's a great way to end it. Uh, all three of you are on Twitter. We've mentioned it. So, Gail, what's your Twitter name? At Gail Voss Oxlade. So, G A I L V A Z O X L A D. There you go. And everybody follows her, anyways. And Carrie K. Taylor is actually on on Twitter. As Squawk Fox, S Q U A W K F O X. There you go. And Robert Brown, you are. At Wealthing Rabbit. At Wealthing Rabbit. Where'd you get that? From the book. From the book. From the book. That's pretty good. Just that's, one rabbit? That's, well, there's more than one rabbit when they're done compounding. But, <laughs> oh, excellent. Just look at us. But just one in the, in the Twitter <laughs> handle. Excellent. So the easiest way to follow everyone here is is on Twitter. I'm at Doug Hoyes because I couldn't think of anything fancy like everyone else did here. So um, thank you all for being here today. The uh, That was excellent, as were the butter Thanks tarts. Thanks for the butter tarts. Hey, absolutely. Thank it's, you, uh, It's an excellent excuse to get together. That's our show for today. As always, links to everything we talked about, including how to find each of the books written by my guests, can be found at hoys.com. That's H-O-Y-E-S.com. I will also post a full transcript of today's discussion. And in the show notes, I'll have links to each of my guest Twitter accounts and websites. So we're going to uh, eat a few more butter tarts. Until next week, thanks for listening. I'm Doug Hoyes. That was debt-free in, well, 40 minutes today.